words like cool. Most of its synonyms fall out of fashion because they stop meeting their own definitions, but cool has persisted. While what is cool might change, the word itself has seen some pretty consistent usage over the years. The term has its roots in the ways that we often associate emotion with temperature. Feelings might run hot, or you might need to chill out. You can feel the heat of passion. Ooh. What was that? You felt it too. Or treat someone with icy contempt. Now they tell me that I paid my debt to society. Funny I never got a check. In this way, cool has always necessitated a distance. To be cool, your emotions cannot be making the decisions and rationality takes center stage. Coolness is a difficult aesthetic to define. It is both deeply subjective and dependent on the times. More a set of contemporary iconography or tone than an identifiable aesthetic. It is simultaneously effortless and up to date on whatever the latest trends are. It is an aesthetic of carelessness while also possessing a methodical attention to detail. There is nothing less cool than someone trying to look cool. If this, this, this could all comfortably be described as cool, then what purpose is there in defining the term at all? As much as it can be slippery, I do believe there are inherent values and connotations we ascribe to things that are cool. And in understanding what gets to be cool, we can better understand exactly what that means. Okay. Mm -hmm. The teens in Rotterdam, their bags in Brussels. He's the modern man, disconnected, frightened, paranoid, but with good reason. It's too sad to be funny, unusable. I think I can get a good 20 minutes out of it. Great. One of the foremost associations that coolness has is its relationship to masculinity. Hollywood's leading men tend to be inscrutable, effortless, and utterly self-assured of their place in the world. This framing then bleeds into how we think of stars more broadly outside of the context of their films with the lavish spectacle of their lives coming to define an image of coolness as much as their characters do. It is a term that is inextricably tied with masculinity, both in the ways it is expressed and who it is expressed by. This is not to suggest that women are never framed as cool in the same way as men, but that when they are, it tends to be with the language of masculine coolness. Sarah Connor, Furiosa, Ripley, and The Bride all comfortably fit into expectations of the archetypal action hero, but do so using those same masculine tropes. For an example of this from the Oceans films, see Catherine Zeta-Jones's Interpol agent turned thief, Isabel Lahiri. It's sunglasses, brutal efficiency, and violent problem solving all the way up. In this way, the female action hero's coolness is no less masculine as those are the terms in which it is expressed. Perhaps this is why the heist movie has so confidently adopted the aesthetic stylings of coolness. It is a genre dominated by male casts in which rational one-upsmanship, staying calm under pressure, and stories about pride dominate. Female-led heist movies obviously do exist, one of which will be the primary focuses of this video, but they tend to knowingly work against the expectation that the cast will be male. What do you think we are, a bunch of pussies? The heist film is an odd genre. Many critics hesitate to even define it as one, and much has been written about whether its tropes, themes, and narratives cohere into a stable genre of its own. For my purposes, I'm going to rely on Slowinski and Leach's designation of it as a subgenre of the crime film, as I found that to be the most useful way in considering how coolness is integral to its structure. David Boardwell outlines four key phases to a heist film. The initiators recruit participants. As a group, they are briefed and prepare their plan. They study their target, rehearse their scheme, or take steps to make it easier. The heist itself begins and concludes, and finally the aftermath of the heist, failed or successful, shows the fates of the participants. He recognizes that this is far from a comprehensive list, 
but in terms of understanding the heist as a genre, I feel they are a useful starting point. In contrast to the traditional crime film, which trends towards character studies that focus on the personal impacts of leading a violent and dangerous life, the heist film focuses tightly on the specific crime itself. This is made clear by the structure portal outlines where each point indelibly links a character's motivation, arc, and goal to one big heist. This structure is part of why coolness has become so integral to the heist film. It provides a very basic framework on which as much or as little emotional weight and drama can be hung without destabilizing the core pleasures of the genre. On top of this basic structure are dozens of tropes, the skilled criminal pulling off one last job before getting out of the game for good, a core team each with their own unique set of skills and personalities, the spurned lover throwing a wrench in the perfect plot, and so on. It is a genre where generally the enjoyment is less in the subversion and reinvention of its tropes, and more in the execution of them. For a similar example, take the romantic comedy. It is easy to criticize a rom-com for being formulaic, that the audience knows full well that the two leads will get together in the end after falling into and out of love throughout the narrative, but that criticism is missing the point of why these films find an audience. It is in the execution of the idea, the chemistry between the two leads, the back and forth tension between them, and the dialogue they share. Similarly, the joy of the heist film is in how the basic framework is pulled off, and what the filmmakers use this framework to say. All things considered, this feels particularly fitting for the heist film, where it is the careful execution of a plan that is the core centerpiece of the narrative. The next two parts will be focusing primarily on Soderbergh's trilogy 11, 12, and 13, with some divergence into the original film. The last part of this essay will be devoted specifically to Ocean's 8. A little less conversation, a little more action, please. All this aggravation ain't satisfaction in me. A little more bite, a little less bark, a little less fight, a little more spark. Close your mouth and open up your heart and maybe satisfy me. Coolness in film is as much in how you see something as what you are seeing. To me, this is what sets the Ocean's films apart from other heist films or even mainstays of other traditionally cool genres like action or noir. They are not tales of hardened criminals living for the thrill of a life of violence or stealing to meet any kind of need. The Ocean's films are concerned with nothing aside from the breezy, stylish fantasy of being a thief. This is what makes them an archetypal example of masculine coolness. They are far too cool to be concerned with the baggage and emotional weight of the more traditional crime narrative. Their coolness permeates the films at a micro and macro level and becomes the defining characteristic of the series. Paul Mason argues that heist films are also about imagination and poetry. They examine aesthetic activity by encoding the values of imagination and creative effort into criminal activity and construct criminals as rule-breaking artist geniuses whose labor, mental or physical, unfolds as a process of artistic creation and their efforts producing an artistic or creative work. This reading of the heist itself as art is of particular relevance to the Ocean's films where how one pulls off a heist is just as, if not more important, than the reward itself. Characters speak about past heists as if they are a body of work. He started in the early 90s. Bank of Geneva, the Danish Treasury, the Bank of Italy, AMC AMRO, the Brussels Diamond Exchange, the Antwerp Diamond Exchange. Wait, wait, all those in the 1990s? I'm only up to 96. There is even a scene where the crew of the original heist disagree over referring to it as Ocean's Eleven. They want to be properly credited for their work. Now you told me that your wife said that he called it Ocean Eleven. Now who decided that? I'm a private contract. It was a collaboration. That moniker is insulting. Yeah, I mean, Danny, it was one job that we did together, so I don't know where this whole, like, proprietary stance comes from. Wait, it seems a little possessive. One could know? make the argument that because it was, in fact, Danny's idea, maybe no, it should No, hang be... on a minute. We all had our own areas of expertise. I mean, without us, it don't leave your head, mate. It just 
hurts. This is in clear contrast to how we most often think of criminals as wanting a degree of anonymity for obvious reasons. The intricacy of these crimes is always framed as just as much a work of art as whatever valuable they might be stealing. A clear example of this is towards the end of Ocean's 13, where, after a successful heist, their score is apparently stolen by a rival criminal wielding a gun. A gun? Their reaction is complete disappointment that a fellow artist would resort to such a dull way to pull off a robbery, with the reveal that the gun is empty only adding to the wound. Framing the heist in this way allows for some breathing room to emphasize the glamour and excitement of a perfectly orchestrated crime. Soderbergh uses every inch of this space to emphasize the coolness of his cast. Every single thing in the Bellagio, the first casino that they rob, looks expensive. It's all bathed in yellow gold light with flashing neon signs and deep turquoise card tables. The maroon uniforms of the attendants and the black suits who are criminals. Its security systems are improbably elaborate with changing key codes and laser guarded elevator shafts, along with tactics equally elaborate to get around them. Fake vaults, remote control vans, and an electromagnetic pulse. This repositions the artistry of the crime as a practical necessity within the context of the film. This is one of the ways that the film negotiates the various interior conflicts that coolness brings up. The crew aren't trying too hard or showing off because the extravagant artistry of their crime is necessary and executed with all the rational masculine gravitas that they can manage. This is all stitched together with cheesy transitions that emphasize that particular kind of tacky decadence that Vegas is known for. The editing in particular stands out across all three films, the camera moving as effortlessly as the characters it follows, cutting across time and space without ever confusing the audience more than intended. However, given the way that information is withheld from the audience throughout, such as the reveal of the fake vault, there is the sense that even this level of slick, effortless editing is not quite enough to fully keep up with the crew. These moments of misdirection tend to culminate in equally stylish reveals where the camera zooms and whips around the space to show the spectator exactly what they had missed the first time. Also common is the use of split screens, which further give the sense that the heist is operating faster than even the audience can keep track of, with everything unfolding all at once. A scene that has always stood out to me as a key example of all this is near the beginning of Ocean's Eleven, where Danny outlines the plan for the Bellagio job. The camera pans and zooms around money carts and key cards to the various gang members watching them, as Danny explains via voiceover what it is they're looking for. The movement reveals the technicalities of their plan while also making the spectator feel like they're a part of it, observing alongside the members of the crew and imparting some of that critical coolness onto them. Following a shot of Basher dropping down into the sewers, the camera takes up the movement of a passing pedestrian beginning to spin around various settings from the casino control room to the crew's hotel room to a strip club, creating the very literal sense of a plan being set into motion. This motion is then continued into the next shot as the camera zooms once more into a bundle of balloons before fading into their place in the plan, floating up to block out the security cameras long enough for another member of the ice to slip behind the curtain. There is a lot going on here, and I could spend far more time than I have done breaking it down, but I think what's important to note here is that it all looks so effortless. Every movement and cut is motivated and flows smoothly. The predominant feeling I get from this scene is, rather straightforwardly, that it looks cool. It feels cool, and it feels like you're a part of all of it, and there is genuine artistry in making something look this effortless. The effect of all of this is to enhance what is already there. It is not difficult to convince an audience that George Clooney is cool. The beauty of the Oceans films is that they take their stars and give them a world and style that is deserving of this elevated level of glamour. Gotta have a good reason to break the law, do something like rob them. and we need a moral reason. I've watched over a dozen heist movies in preparation for this essay, and whether or not the robbery tends to be successful often hinges on the moral implications behind it. 
are they robbing from the rich to feed the poor, or are they stealing for their own selfish advancement? I think these questions speak to one of the core tensions of the heist film, between coolness and emotion. Moral motivation is, in many respects, completely antithetical to coolness. For a heist to have some kind of emotional, moral grounding, its participants must show something other than the slick, uncaring detachment that is so integral to an aesthetic of coolness. For this reason, it is often the case that it is the emotional component that causes a heist to fail. An ex-partner giving away the game, or a protagonist pushing too far for the sake of revenge. This need for moral motivation is rooted in the restrictions of the production code, which, throughout the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, dictated what could or could not be shown in Hollywood cinema. If you were going to have a criminal in your film, they needed to be punished for their actions, either through legal means or their death. For this reason, almost every early heist movie ends in failure of some kind. The original Ocean's Eleven, Rafifi, The Killing, and The Asphalt Jungle all end on a somber note, reinforcing the idea that crime doesn't pay. The production code has long since been abandoned, and our criminals have only grown more sympathetic over the years, but the need to have a firm moral motivation for their actions has remained, and those without one are doomed to fail. The emotional core of Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven is Danny's desire to win back his ex-wife from the man that they're robbing. This is framed unambiguously as a problem. Tell me this is not about her, or I am walking. I am walking off this job right now. Escalating to the point where Danny is asked to step back from the heist entirely. This, however, is where Ocean's Eleven chooses to both have its cake and eat it, as it's later revealed that the tension in the group is itself part of the heist. Danny's plan to win back Tess gives him the perfect alibi for the night of the robbery. This way the film gets to both have an emotional motivation while never having to deal with the consequences or weight of bringing that emotion to the heist itself. This is, in many respects, the perfect resolution to the conflict for a film like Ocean's Eleven. Danny and Tessa's relationship is all glamour. Their arguments and tensions are exciting, giving Danny someone to confidently match his wit and charm. It allows our criminals to be motivated by emotion without breaching their impenetrable coolness. In both 11 and 13, the heist is over a Las Vegas casino, which itself sits on shaky moral ground to begin with. Places of gambling are often prime targets in heist films for this reason, with the perceived immorality of gambling and the exploitation of people making them fair game for would-be criminals. The Ocean's films use coolness as an opportunity to breeze by any and all moral complexity. As a point of contrast, take Michael Mann's Heat. In that film, characters use rational masculine coolness as a veneer to hide the obsessive violent reality that they embody. In the Ocean's films, our characters are all veneer. Their crimes are convoluted and flashy, avoiding violence altogether. Being a criminal in the world of these films comes with none of the associated baggage of a life of crime. There are no struggles with addiction or strained relationships. Being a thief in the Ocean's films is just another job, one that so happens to be at odds with the law. I think a productive way to unpack these ideas of morality and coolness is to examine the film that Soderbergh is remaking. Bordwell describes the 1960s Rat Pack film of the same title rather succinctly as a film about cool guys hanging out. Much of the original is exactly this, with the majority of the film's runtime being devoted to the various characters either trying to convince each other to take part in the heist or discussing the details of the crime itself. The vast majority of the film is completely changed in Soderbergh's remake, and so what's interesting to me here are the elements that mark out the Rat Pack as cool that made it into its contemporary counterpart. Many have argued that the heist film was born out of the tradition of noir, with the genre shifting sympathies from victims to would-be criminals. Men in suits smoking cigarettes seems to be a somewhat timeless image of coolness, and it's not difficult to see noir's influence in this regard. The connotations of the suit have not changed much in the last hundred years, projecting wealthy, confident, and sophisticated masculinity, and as such as coolness has never really been in question. Wearing blackface and cheating on your wife, however, have aged less gracefully. 
more or less extreme example, framing the 11 members of the heist as World War II veterans feels very of its time. It signals an inherent morality to these men that even though they're thieves, they're patriots at heart. Here, that tension between coolness and emotion ultimately snaps. The film is simultaneously critical of its protagonists and in awe of their coolness. For every dour discussion on whether or not they should pull off the job, there is a scene where women swoon over Dean Martin as he plays the piano. The original does not commit to the carefree effervescence of Soderbergh's remake, nor to the gritty examinations of masculinity of a film like Heat. And so the entire experience feels somewhat awkward, like the film is criticizing you for enjoying it. I point this out to emphasize that this tension that morality brings to the table is not always so neatly resolved as it might appear in Soderbergh's films. It is influenced by almost every facet of a film's construction, from tone to character to technique. Although it seems obviously contradictory, coolness does not lend itself to being implemented carelessly. To appear effortless requires an enormous amount of effort. It, the precision, right? It, it, it's always the attention to detail and the little grace notes that really make something sing. But how much of the Ocean series style is wrapped up in Soderbergh's direction and the charms of his cast? What happens when you take a film series defined by such an overtly masculine aesthetic as coolness and flip it to an all-female cast with a new director? Well... Ocean's 8 acts as a kind of reboot for the franchise, releasing 11 years after the original trilogy concluded with an all-new cast, director, and presumably the goal of another trilogy, 8, 9, and 10. Although, as of writing, we only have 8. The film is between a rock and a hard place when it comes to an aesthetic of coolness. To simply apply the tropes of masculine coolness to an all-female cast would make the decision to have an all-female cast feel more like a calculated marketing stunt, a token effort to appease as much of their potential audience as possible. To pivot toward a more feminine cool threatens similarly tired expectations of gender and would necessitate a distinct style and vision for what this new cast looks like and how they operate. This leaves Ocean's 8 with the unenviable task of either conforming to the tropes of masculine coolness or to the expectations of femininity. It is this conflict where the film's direction becomes the defining issue. It's not that there's anything especially wrong with Gary Ross's style, but more that it fails to stand out in the same way that his characters do. His scenes lack the energy and style of Soderbergh's trilogy, from lighting to transitions to pacing. It's all competent and clear, but none of that is in keeping with the extravagant and glossy tone of the series. Much of the surface details are present, most notably those cheesy scene transitions, but without considering why they were there and what motivated them. This makes them feel more like an obligation than a creative choice. I'm not trying to suggest that Ross needed to emulate Soderbergh's style, but More that this film needed a level of visual effervescence beyond its extravagant set design and beautiful stars. Navigating these issues of gendered coolness would have been a difficult task for any director, but in order to do so, the film needed to carve out a clearly defined style and personality which feels lacking in the final product. So, if you couldn't bring back the director of the original trilogy and wanted to define a new style for your all-female cast, why wouldn't you hire a woman to do it? I think anyone would find it difficult to make the case that Ross's approach was so integral to the film that he needed to be the one to direct. It gives the entire film the feeling of supporting representation for its use as a marketing tool rather than in pursuit of any real diversity within the genre. An all-female Oceans film absolutely could have worked. It could have worked with this cast, and there are glimmers of that within the film that we got. But shifting to an all-female cast here was less a creative choice intended to give some much-needed variety and representation to an overwhelmingly male-dominated genre, and more a cynical marketing ploy to chase current trends within the industry. The film's emotional grounding doesn't fare much better. 
On the surface, Debbie's motivation isn't all that far from Danny's was in the first film, Revenge. After being set up by her partner, Debbie ends up in prison and plots a heist to frame her ex. A woman scorned is about as played out a trope as you're going to get in film, but this doesn't necessarily doom it as a plot point. The problem here is in the target, Claude Becker, pretentious, womanizing moron. While his actions are detestable, he never feels like a serious threat to the heist in the same way that Terry Benedict or the Night Fox does. Where Tess, Danny, and Terry all feel like they're a match for each other, Claude's place is just another pawn to be moved around by the crew. As a result, it isn't all that satisfying to see him go down. The end result is that the core conflict to this film feels petty. This, again, is not necessarily a bad thing. There are plenty of interesting stories about trivial topics, but here it drags down the glamour and style of its stars. Claude gets what he deserves, yes, but Debbie feels like she won the moment she walks out of prison, and from there, the only way is down. Ocean's 8 is not a bad film. It's not even a bad heist film, but it is a bad Ocean's film. What is interesting to me, and why I've spent so much time discussing it, is that it fails in precisely the ways that Soderbergh's trilogy works. It grinds when it should feel effortless. Its stars are dragged down to petty squabbling rather than shining, and the style it does have feels imported. You shook Sinatra's hand. You should know better, Willie. Really. There's a recurring line in Ocean's 13 about shaking Frank Sinatra's hand, with the phrase acting as a kind of marker of people who have some degree of respectability. The film's villain is someone who shook Sinatra's hand, but has apparently forgotten what that should mean when it comes to respecting one's fellow criminals. This is obviously an allusion to Sinatra's starring role in the original film, cemented by the credits rolling over one of his songs, but I think it also serves as a perfect symbol of how coolness is constructed in these films. Shaking Sinatra's hand doesn't mean anything, really. It is a vaguely masculine symbol that is imbued with this veneer of respectability and gravitas. It is a gesture towards images of coolness. It sounds like it means something, and for all intents and purposes, that is more than enough. Coolness is necessarily surfaced. It cannot have any deeper meaning or subtext, or it would cease to be straightforwardly cool. The Ocean's films commit to this completely. They are interested only in how slick and suave their stars can be, how smoothly they can communicate convoluted intricacies of a plan that only makes sense in the context of showing off and offering the fantasy of living above the laws that restrict us.